and puts them in his hand like that and blew several really quite long delayed breaths into his fists. Then he opened his hand and handed me the crucifix. Well, I didn't know what to say. So then the other story some people here asked me to tell before I started talking was um, the crucifix because people ask to see the crucifix. But it's uh, just a little thing and it's very fragile and I'm afraid to take it any place because it's so fragile. But at least tell me, let me tell you how that happened. You remember years ago how on Mahashivaratri Swami would uh, bring the lingam up out of some place within him, would come out of his mouth, eventually then be caught in a handkerchief. You know, he would be on the platform and the devotees in front of him, and then there were the bhajans would start, and Swami would sing the bhajans. Then you could see that something was happening, sort of uh, uneasy, uncomfortable, and the bhajans would start to go faster and faster and faster and faster, and then suddenly Swami would go like that and put his hand out in the handkerchief, and out of his mouth would come this lingam. Big things. I was uh, sitting very close to him one time, and uh, out came this flash of light, and he had it in his hand, and it was a uh, lingam on a platform, a little platform, with three legs. How in the world could that come up out of his throat and out of his mouth? I don't know. What one would see would be this flash of light. Whether uh, this power and this light came out, then immediately formed into the lingam, I don't know what happened. But it went on for years. But then people got, uh, there came to be too much publicity about it. And people in the background would start to walk around and disturb. And so then Swami said he wouldn't show the lingam anymore. He wouldn't do that anymore. So it came to an end. So then the next year on Mahashivaratri, a Swami uh, said to me, he said, Hislop, you get a taxi and you be ready at five o'clock in the morning and you take Kasturi in your car and we're going someplace. We're going up to and Kasturi, will know where it is. That's what he didn't tell me because he's afraid I would blab it to somebody. <laughs> and Kasturi will know where it is, he'll tell you. And so we got in the car and Castor said, well, keep on driving. We're going to go up to the Mysore forest. And as we went up to the Mysore forest, there was a constant procession of cars coming towards us. That is, people from all around coming to Brindavan, hoping that the Mahashivaratri would be celebrated in Brindavan. And you know, everybody knows Castor, but all the people in the cars coming knew Castor. They'd seen him for years. And yet, not one of those cars recognized Casturi riding in our taxi. Complete, complete blank, complete disguise of some sort in front of them. They couldn't, couldn't even see him. So we got up to the Mysore forest. And the first thing we did, there was uh, some college students too. Swami had sent up a bus, maybe a dozen or so college students. And the first thing we did was to ride around through the forest uh, trying to find the wild elephant herd. What we had hoped was we would have a repeat of what had happened some years before when Swami had taken a group of devotees to the Mysore forest. Maybe all you know that story, do you? No? Well, they went into a, drove around the forest, then they went into a clearing. And the car stopped. And Swami got out of the car and walked some distance in front of the car. And the devotees also got out and walked in front of the car. Swami went a little further away. Nobody follows him too closely. He stays some distance away from him. And so no sooner had that happened than we, there was a trumpeting at the edge of the forest. And a great big bull elephant stepped out of the forest, trumpeting. Well, the devotees all turned and rushed back to the car. <laughs> and Swami looked at them and said, what 
You're going to leave Swami here all alone? <laughs> and then, out of the forest came this giant tusker right up towards Swami. He reached Swami, and down he goes on his knees and touches his head to Swami's feet. Then gets up and goes back into the forest and the herd disappears. So we had hoped for a replay of that. <laughs> but we couldn't find any elephants whatsoever. So then, driving around, Swami selected the place where Mahashivaratri would be celebrated, where he would do it. We saw a dry stream under a bridge, and Swami said, we'll stop here. This is where we'll have it. So then we went back to the compound and came back about 6.30 for the Mahashivaratri ceremony. We got out of the car, walking down the bank to the dry river. And as we passed some bushes, Swami reached over and broke off two, just two little twigs. And he put them like that and said, well, what's that, Hislop? So I said, well, it's a cross, Swami. So then he takes the two twigs and puts them in his hand like that and blew several really quite long, delayed breaths into his fists. Then he opened his hand and handed me the crucifix. Well, I didn't know what to say. And he said, furthermore, uh, the wood of the cross is a piece of the actual cross upon Christ, uh, which Christ was crucified. Then he added, um, and I can tell you it took uh, a little time and trouble to find a piece of that wood after some 2,000 years. And I noticed a hole at the top of the crucifix. And so I said, well, Swami, what's that hole? And Swami said, well, the cross was hung on a peg. It's not as history says. The cross was hung on a peg, and it was through this hole that it was uh, pegged uh, to, a, uh, to a post. So then we went on down the, the to the river bottom, and we found that as we were sitting on the sand, we were sitting on bones, human bones. And we found it was a place where they burned bodies. And the people said, well, this is quite appropriate for Shiva. I didn't know what they meant when they said that, but later on I learned that that is part of the Indian tradition. And so we sat there, then Swami sang some bhajans, and he then brought out the lingam and passed around and showed it to every one of us and put it on the table in front of him. And then he reached up and pulled out a vase out of the air, which was filled with um, amrith. Then he reached up and pulled a spoon out of the air, then walked around and gave each of us a spoon of the amrith. Then, when I got back to uh, the United States with the crucifix, Mrs. Cowan, you know who Mrs. Cowan is? Mrs. Cowan, uh, an old time devotee, she's dead now. She had the first Satchisai bookstore in Tustin, California, and used to go there all the time with Mr. Cowan. Maybe I'll have time later on to tell you the story, or maybe this afternoon, the story of the resurrection of Mr. Cowan. So Mrs. Cowan wanted pictures of the crucifix to add to her inventory in the store. And so I said, well, it would have to be with Swami's permission. So somehow she got Swami's permission. And so a professional photographer who was a devotee, we were living in Mexico, my wife and I. In fact, that is our home the last 20 years in Mexico. We lived in a big house on a hill overlooking the ocean and the islands out in the ocean, and behind us are the mountains of Mexico, a beautiful place. And so he took the photographs, and then he came back a couple of weeks later with the pictures, he did the pictures. We were all sitting around the table admiring the pictures. Now it was a clear, Mexican sky, not a cloud in the sky, just completely still, still. And suddenly, as we were staring at the pictures and thinking of Swami, there was a sudden burst of thunder, a loud burst of thunder, and a big wind came 
we have big French windows to look out on the ocean, blew open the French windows and banged the doors and blew all the curtains in the house back and forth. And so everybody was puzzled. And they said, uh, what is that? How could that be? And then my wife said, oh, it's in the Bible. So then she went and got the Bible and found the appropriate uh, passage where the winds had uh, come into the temple and had rent the curtains of uh, the temple. And so um, then another time a chap came down from uh, Northern California and wanted to see the crucifix. So we showed him the crucifix. And as we were showing him the crucifix, uh, there was like an earthquake, the whole house shook. And so then Fanna Bunda wanted to put the crucifix in his book, a Vision of Divinity, I think it's called. And so I wrote him the story about the uh, crucifix, how um, we'd had this tremendous wind of blowing the doors and renting the curtains of the house, and how there'd been an earthquake and the other chap was looking at it. And uh, whenever Swami goes to Bombay, he usually stops at the house of Fanna Bunda and visits Fanna Bunda and his wife and their two children. And this time, there happened to be laying beside Fanna Bunda's typewriter, he was working on his book, this letter that I had written Fanna Bunda. And Swami picked it up and read it. And Fanna Bunda asked him, well, Swami, is that correct? And Swami said, oh yes, that's correct. That's, the correct, that's exactly, what, exactly what happened. It was the recapitulation of the death of Christ. And then I went down, they asked me to come to, go down to Latin America, to El Salvador, to talk to the people there. And at the home of the ghost, or the host rather, not the ghost, <laughs> the Holy Ghost was about to come, so that's why I got that mixed up. And uh, all the Salvadorian people were in this great big house of the head devotee, and uh, the crucifix, I had taken it down, was on the table. And suddenly, it was a bright, shiny day there, suddenly a tremendous thunder and it poured rain and the wind blew open his windows. Same thing happened exactly as it did in our house in Mexico. So it's a very powerful thing, that crucifix. I'm sorry I couldn't bring it to show to you, but it's so fragile that I'm afraid to, afraid to carry it around. So those were the two stories I was asked to tell before I started to talk. So those who asked me, I've done that.